20 major surface ships destroyed, two supercarriers sunk, 3,000 American airmen and sailors dead. That's the price for Taiwan's freedom in case of a Chinese attack. A recent spate of comprehensive war games took a look at the possibility of defending Taiwan from Chinese attack, running over 20 simulations of varying degrees of intensity, including handicaps for U.S. forces, the war games made a startling discovery. China fails to take Taiwan in nearly all scenarios, but the U.S. pays a huge price for it. But short, should the U.S. even be defending a small island nation thousands of miles from its own shores? And why should it pay for its freedom with its own blood and capital? The short answer is yes. The long answer is yes again, with many detailed reasons why. Let us explain. Taiwan is more than a thorn in China's side. The island nation was a refuge for the Chinese nationalists who fled the mainland after losing the Chinese Civil War shortly after World War II. Since then, the dictatorship that once ruled the island has transitioned into a flourishing democracy with some of the highest voter turnout rates of any democracy in the world. The Taiwanese people fiercely defend their democracy, and with polls showing that nearly 80% of Taiwanese people are in favor of stronger ties to the U.S. than China, there doesn't seem to be a diplomatic way for China to annex the island. For China, Taiwan is an existential threat to its ruling Chinese Communist Party. The CCP has enjoyed complete control over the Chinese people for nearly a century, but as China modernizes and more of its citizens travel to study and live abroad, discontent grows at home over the dictatorial rule of the CCP. Chinese dissidents are increasingly calling for democratic reforms and the end to the CCP surveillance state, with programs like Social Capital, where each citizen is assigned a social score based on their good behavior and support for the government, driving a lot of Chinese youth who can afford it out of the country. Taiwan offers a different model for Chinese dissidents, a democratic one. Sitting less than 100 miles off its own coast, Taiwanese democracy is infectious, and the CCP cannot allow the contagion to continue unchecked for much longer. But reuniting Taiwan by force is also vital for China's national security and its ambition to become the world's reigning superpower. Currently, China is hemmed in by U.S.-aligned nations in what's known as the First Island Chain. Established during the Cold War to contain the Soviet Union and China, the First Island Chain stretches from Japan through Taiwan down to the Philippines and ensures that China cannot project military power into the Pacific without being attacked from all sides. Taking Taiwan would break that First Island Chain and seriously complicate matters for American allies such as Japan and the Philippines. With free access to the Pacific, China could also begin to field more blue water-capable forces which would allow it to protect its critical seaborne trade where it matters most, in the Indian Ocean and in the Straits of Malacca. Both are natural choke points for Chinese trade, where India, the US, or any Chinese rival could in effect completely strangle the Chinese economy by denying it critical trade. With most of its oil imported via the sea, China is extremely vulnerable to trade disruption. But Taiwan is important to both the US and China for one other major reason. If Taiwan fell into China's hands today, China could very well shape the face of the planet for the foreseeable future. Back in the late 1980s, the Taiwanese began to invest in semiconductor manufacturing. Now the nation provides nearly two-thirds of the global supply of semiconductors and all of its most advanced models. The US, waking up from a deep Cold War victory-induced stupor, just recently realized that all its eggs were in the Taiwanese basket, and working with Taiwan will be opening up a semiconductor manufacturing hub in Arizona. However, the most advanced 3mm models will continue to only be produced on Taiwan itself, a clever piece of insurance. Semiconductors are important because the tiny electronic devices are present in all advanced electronics everywhere on the Earth. Without access to semiconductors, national economies would come to a screeching halt. We already saw the effect that a simple slowdown of manufacturing caused when electronics and vehicle prices skyrocketed halfway through the global COVID pandemic. If China were to take Taiwan, it would then be in control of most of the world's manufacturing of semiconductors, and any nation that did not want its economy to collapse would in effect have to do as China instructed. And that would include the United States of America, because without Taiwanese semiconductors, all of the U.S. military's most advanced weapons basically become one-time use with no resupply. Whether they know it or not, the American people are directly bound to the freedom of Taiwan. A Chinese invasion of Taiwan is unlikely but not impossible, and in fact only increasing in likelihood. China, under President Xi Jinping, has repeatedly stated that reunification is not up for debate. What is up for debate is whether Taiwan agrees to reunify peacefully or not. As Taiwan shows no sign of wanting to come under the umbrella of the CCP and Chinese influence operations have hilariously backfired on the island, a military option grows in likelihood year over year. The good news is that a Chinese invasion of Taiwan is likely to fail. The bad news is that it'll only fail if the U.S. is prepared to pay dearly for it.
In the most pessimistic war game scenarios, the United States suffered up to 20 large surface combat ships sunk, including two supercarriers. The US and Japan both lost hundreds of aircraft, about 90% of those on the ground in the opening stages of the war, as air bases from Japan to Guam came under ballistic missile attack from the People's Liberation Army Rocket Force. Nearly 4,000 US sailors and airmen are killed in action, with many more wounded. The United States loses more material over a few months of war than it has since World War II. Yet, in all scenarios but those specifically designed to handicap the United States, Taiwan remains independent and China suffers a horrific loss. 100,000 of its troops are either killed or captured on Taiwan. Over 50 of its large surface combatants are sunk including two aircraft carriers. Nearly its entire amphibious assault fleet is destroyed, and over 150 aircraft are also shot down. The US's ability to project power globally is severely curtailed, as it takes years to rebuild its armed forces, but China's is absolutely crippled, taking decades to rebuild its capabilities and recover from the costs of the war. But a US-Taiwan victory relies on multiple very important factors, and it's unsure if the United States could realistically or even would try to meet all those goals in time to stop a Chinese invasion. The first of these factors is the cooperation of Japan. Without Japan, the Chinese invasion of Taiwan is much more likely to succeed. Not only does Japan provide a significant boost to combat power in the region, but it's a critical base of operations for American aircraft and ships. Would Japan really commit to fighting China alongside the US, though? In the opening hours of the conflict, China would have to make a very hard decision to strike American air bases in Japan or not. Attacking these air bases would cripple America's ability to threaten China's invasion fleet in the first week or two of the war, giving it a critical window to move heavy combat power to the island. However, it would also run the risk of immediately bringing Japan into the fight on America's side. So China would have to decide if the gain was worth the risk. And simply put, it is. China has no choice. If it doesn't eliminate US bases in Japan with heavy and sustained missile attack, then its invasion of Taiwan has no chance of succeeding. Japan is already almost certain to join the war against China on America's side anyway. Japan and China have their own territorial dispute over a chain of islands that both sides claim, but China is a massive threat to Japan, who's also very dependent on seaborne trade. Right now, Japanese free trade is guaranteed by the might of the US Navy, but if China won Taiwan and kicked the US out of the South Pacific, Japanese trade would be at the mercy of China. This is a strategically unacceptable position for the Japanese. Japan has already moved toward an increased readiness position in regard to China. After decades of embracing pacifism, a rising China and its bullying of its neighbors has prompted Japan to take the unprecedented step of giving up pacifism. Japanese forces are now gearing up for the offensive, not a defensive war, which includes purchasing long-range strike weapons. Enshrined within the Japanese constitution is a clause which now allows Japan to deploy its self-defense forces proactively to fight far from home if it's believed the conflict threatens the security of Japan itself. A US-China conflict is exactly why this clause was drafted, and unless there's massive shifts in the Japanese politics, Japan's inclusion in the conflict is guaranteed. China must also weigh the decision to attack facilities in Australia with its long-range ballistic missiles. Increasingly, the deepening US-Australian alliance is resulting in the creation of air bases and other facilities to be used in case of regional conflict by the US air and naval power. From Australia, US tanker aircraft could accompany strike aircraft right to the outer threat envelope of Chinese defenses, letting American air power join the fight at a time it's looking increasingly likely that naval air power won't be able to do the job alone. Australia can also provide several surface vessels in support of Allied operations against the Chinese, but starting in the 2030s, it'll be able to conduct long-range undersea operations thanks to a fleet of US-made nuclear submarines to be transferred to Australia. Upon announcement of the AUKUS security partnership between Australia, the UK, and America, China sent several diplomatic protests over the nuclear submarines to be delivered to Australia, claiming the US was dangerously proliferating nuclear technology but the submarines will only be nuclear-powered, not nuclear-armed, giving them the range required to threaten Chinese vessels with conventional weapons. Next, the United States must lean heavily on its stealth fleet. In every war game scenario, conventional US air power was decimated by Chinese air defenses and fighters. The results were clear. Either the US needs to invest in many more conventional fleets, a mix of conventional and stealth, or on more stealth aircraft. 
Many critics favor the mixed fleet concept when looked at a purely kill-to-cost ratio. It makes no sense to purchase more conventional aircraft even if stealth aircraft are more expensive. The F-35 has an unclassified kill ratio of 25 or 35 to 1 in combat exercises where it's not purposefully being put at a disadvantage. Despite costing significantly more than conventional F-15s, the F-35 is simply going to survive longer and be more useful. But it's stealth bombers that are vitally important here, and this coincides with the third great contention facing the United States in defense of Taiwan, should the US carry out strikes inside of China itself. As has been noted, no nuclear power has ever been subject to conventional strikes inside its own border. Many fear that US strikes inside of the Chinese mainland would escalate the situation and tempt the use of nuclear weapons, and thus argue against it. Yet not carrying out these strikes would enable China to essentially carry out combat operations wholly undisturbed, a frankly stupid proposition when the US and its alliances are already at a massive range disadvantage. Unless threatened with nuclear weapons itself or with the prospect of national destruction, China would not rely on the use of nuclear weapons for two reasons. First, it would become an immediate international pariah state, cut off from the global community. With its economy hugely reliant on exports, this is something China can ill afford. Also, if it aims to become the world's reigning superpower, it's going to need at least a considerable portion of the world to actually support it. Using nuclear weapons in retaliation to conventional strikes on its military facilities and infrastructure would kill any international support immediately. The second reason China won't use nukes is because the US also has nukes, and more of them. China is increasing the size of its nuclear arsenal, but it would be national suicide to launch a nuclear attack against the US. Attacking Chinese infrastructure, port facilities, and airfields would allow the US to throw off the momentum of a Chinese attack on Taiwan and severely curtail losses for itself and its allies. But there's only one option on the table for penetrating China's extremely dense air defense network – stealth bombers. The current fleet of B-2 bombers simply are not enough, which is why the US is rushing the B-21 Raider into full-rate production. With plans to acquire over a hundred of the aircraft, the American B-21 Raider fleet may even be enough to deter a war before it starts. Next, the US desperately needs to increase its stock of LRASMs. These new modern and extremely capable anti-ship missiles feature long ranges and stealth characteristics. In war game scenarios, LRASMs absolutely devastated the Chinese Navy, but the US has very low numbers of these brand new weapons. The US was buying about 20 to 25 of these missiles per year, but in 2021 signed a contract for 137 LRASMs. Total stockpile is unknown, but it's believed that the US only has a few hundred of these weapons, and this is frankly insufficient. If the US is either to win or deter a war from starting in the first place, it needs to field these missiles at a rate at least partly comparable to the older and much more vulnerable Harpoon missiles, which are increasingly ineffective against modern air defenses. Lastly, the remaining factor determining a US or Chinese victory in the Pacific is the US's willingness to respond. If America does not respond immediately and with the full might of its military, it risks entering the war at a later stage and facing an incredibly uphill battle. Without US and Allied air support, Taiwan is estimated to be able to resist for about three weeks before falling to the Chinese. To prevent this, the United States must immediately respond to Chinese invasion and without self-limiting deterrence factors such as not striking at the Chinese mainland to disrupt its combat operations. Any hesitation by the US only increases the cost later in terms of life and material, and it makes it less likely for the US allies in the region to involve themselves. A fall of Taiwan would not only set the same terrible precedent as a fall of Ukraine, that in the 21st century dictatorships can overcome democracies at will, but threatens to create a future where the world is largely influenced by the whims of a deeply anti-democratic and anti-human rights Chinese Communist Party. Now go check out China's plan to take over the world or click this other video instead.